Hi everyone, here we are at the last session of the conference. Our next speaker has co-founded several startups and worked for large corporations, including Philips DSM Port of Rotterdam, before leading the team at Port Exchange. Please welcome Stuart, CEO of Port Exchange. Thank you, Kunita, and hi everyone. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Unfortunately, this is a virtual uh, event, event still, uh, as we see uh, quite a lot of cases popping up back here in the Netherlands as well. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's unfortunate. On the other hand, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be part of your program. Um, as we have experienced a bit here and there when it comes to uh, digital port implementation strategies, uh, and we have, uh, let's say, suffered from uh, from some of the risks uh, that, that you can uh, encounter there. So I'm, I'm happy to, to share those experiences with you. Um, a bit about me in the background. Uh, my name is indeed Shuti Jager. Thanks for the introduction. And um, um, personally, I joined the Port of Rotterdam in 2017. Um, part of the uh, Pronto project at the time. Uh, it was a, a project to build a digital infrastructure to share data around port calls, to enable just-in-time sailing, um, and to make the port more efficient in general. Um, I led the team, and then we decided to spin out as a separate company uh, to ensure that we could also uh, use this um, and embed this situ uh, software in other ports around the world, driven by the demand from two of the main carriers that we work with, uh, being Shell and Maersk. They basically said, if you optimize Rotterdam, that's nice, but uh, ideally we optimize all ports we go to. Uh, so, uh, so why don't you try out and see if we can implement uh, your system also in other ports, which is uh, what we did. As of 2019, we, uh, we moved from Rotterdam to seven other ports, uh, most of them in Europe and one in the US, uh, in Houston. Uh, and uh, four, uh, no, five out of them have converted into uh, uh, users and actually paying users as well. So, so we do something right. But I have to say, uh, the last two years uh, was also a challenge, uh, and and a lot of reality checks uh, actually that I uh, that I encountered. Um, so I'll share a bit about that. Um, my personal background: um, I'm an industrial engineer by training uh, from Eindhoven University of Technology. Worked with uh, large corporates, but also started a few uh, startups myself. Um, I'm a father of two boys, uh, four and two years old, uh, and the third one is on the way. Also a boy, so we have a busy household here. Uh, and if I'm not, uh, you know, it's a bit of the the rush hour of my life, if you if you can say. Um, it's uh, running a startup, uh, having a, a young family, and also uh, trying to find some time to do kite surfing, which I like to do a lot, uh, and I read if I can, uh, but not these years, uh, I think. Um, but let's let's get to it. So that's me um, in a nutshell. Uh, well, this is not something I think everyone knows, but the, the international shipping industry is responsible for the carriers of around 90 percent of world trade. Um, and it provides fuel, food, raw materials, other products essential for our daily life. Uh, as such, uh, ports play a vital role in the international trade of the global economy. Um, I was at uh, COP26 last weekend to discuss the future of shipping. And there it was also said Although the shipping industry only accounts for about 3% of greenhouse gas emissions, which is, by the way, the equivalent to the total uh, annual of, of Germany or the total CO2 exhaust of Shell as a company worldwide, uh, it's still quite a lot. Um, and actually, if you, if you decarbonize shipping, you decarbonize the world. Uh, so that's, I think, a very strong message that the shipping industry has a huge impact, let's say, on, on global trade, but also on our efforts to decarbonize the world uh, and create a better future. Um, it's being part of a, both a larger transport and logistics supply chains. And in itself, it's a cluster of companies and businesses active in the transport and logistics sector. Uh, ports play a unique position to fully grasp the potential generated by digitalization as well. Uh, so um, we see quite a lot of forces driving uh, digitalization across the world. And unfortunately, in our efforts to become a more neutral, or let's say become a more carbon neutral uh, sector, um, uh, the focus is very much on, fossil, uh, on, on new fuels, uh, which in the end is the only way to fully decarbonize. However, um, there is so much operational inefficiency uh, across the world, 
we see port coin efficiency um, not only in ports in Europe, but also in in, in other uh, and definitely also in other continents, um, where you see a lot of behaviors uh, that sort of result from the fact that there is a, a, a lack of timely data sharing, there is a low data quality and reliability, there is a lot of data ambiguity, uh, and that causes uh, behaviors you all have seen here and there, perhaps uh, called uh, buffer and suffer, right? So you take additional cargo or you take additional time in order to make sure you are safe uh, because you don't have the, the real-time information. Uh, we see this uh, hurry up and wait uh, a lot in our system every day in multiple ports where vessels go full steam to the port only to realize there is no berth available, the pilots are not available, there's something else going on, there's a fog, uh, whatever. And um, then they wait and they go for anchoring. And then sometimes if you have tidal restriction, that waiting time actually is compounded. Um, you see a lot of reactive instead of proactive decision making. Uh, and, and to a degree, this now become a skill of a good planner in a port to, to hustle its way uh, around the port call when things change. Um, however, um, being able to react uh, to, to proactively uh, take decisions up front, uh, plan the week ahead, if you will, uh, you know, reduces a lot of stress and actually contributes to uh, a lot more efficient ports and port calls. The impact of all of this is basically that vessels and ports and all the actors alike uh, waste a lot of time. Uh, and thereby, they also waste a lot of fuel, which wastes a lot of emissions and then a lot of money. And this is clearly uh, something we experience while, while implementing part of our solution. But we also see it with other tools as they are being implemented, that you can you can reduce port turnaround time quite dramatically when you all collaborate on the same page and when you all have vision on on what happens in the port. Um, we have we have port turnaround time seen cut back by twenty to forty percent in in Rotterdam, for example. We have seen bunker reductions over ten tons per port call in in multiple ports in Europe. Uh, the CO2 equivalent of that is, is roughly around 30 tons per, per port call, which in the end is a huge impact on the total amount of CO2 being wasted, just because vessels have a better view or the marine operator that basically is in contact with the captain or the master has a, has a better view on what's going to happen in the port before the vessel actually arrives. And, and this is something that, um, that allows them to slow steam or to take better decisions up front instead of being confronted with, uh, let's say, a block in the port. And, and now I think especially if you look at ports in, in the US, uh, there's quite a bit of um, uh, quite a bit of congestion, not necessarily only with uh, caused by, by digital uh, collaboration or the lack of it, um, but it definitely has something to do with the fact that um, if you don't share these updates real time or if you're not connected to your hinterland in that sense, um, um, delays will cascades through the whole logistic chain and thereby cause more, uh, let's say, inefficiency. Um, we see clearly uh, also COVID uh, being part of the, the driving forces for digitalization. All of a sudden, uh, all kinds of companies had to work from home uh, and had to make sure that their um, uh, IT landscape was, was up to par, which was a... Um, uh, which was a, a, a big step forward uh, to improve uh, in operational efficiency up until now. Most of the investments have been made toward the basic infrastructure development. Um, but like I said, the COVID has, has revealed uh, the need to invest in digital solutions. Um, if anything could have lessened the problems created by the pandemic, it would have been the information flowing more accurately, quicker and freely. And this is exactly what we see in ports now as well. Uh, being connected uh, gives you a lot of um, advantages uh, to ensure that the information you have uh, gets passed on to other users or to other parts of the port uh, more easily and thereby reduce uh, time. Um, so as I, as I briefly mentioned, we see a, a global transition to a cleaner and greener uh, marine sector is underway. Um, the increased international maritime environment regulations for sulfur emissions, for example, greenhouse gas emissions and ship recycling will affect the industry, obviously, as you can see here in this in this uh, little chart of how we see see the um, what the target is from the Paris Climate Agreement and, and what the outlook looks like. Um, well, it's, it's a bit of a grim picture. Um, 
also the pressure from society is likely to grow as, as younger generations will directly free, feel the impact of climate change therefore it is likely uh, that society will demand changes from industries in the upcoming years towards a more sustainable future especially when it comes to shipping and the interesting thing is you already see this right you see um driven by the pandemic but also by the climate change uh, you see uh, companies like uh, ikea uh, uh, organizing its own uh, shipping infrastructure um, you see companies like Action and some of the other uh, warehouse uh, companies actually arranging different uh, ways of shipping because, one, the current options are too expensive, and two, there's too little guarantee or too little assurance that uh, the sustainability element of that shipping uh, part of the logistics chain is being covered by the incumbents. And, and well, you have to say also, and, and, and this was also made clearly last weekend, where uh, industry leaders from the shipping industries got together to discuss how to decarbonize. Uh, it is a tough challenge to, 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 to take because you have a global supply chain that you need to, in, time, in terms of fuel, that you need to fully overhaul. Um, and, and I have to say, it was interesting to see that there was a lot of focus on uh, what type of fuel to connect with, um, but then to say let's let's try out multiple sources. Um, let's try ammonia. Let's try hydrogen. Let's try biomethanol. Let's try a few out and 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 build those vessels and do pilot tests with them and then select one or select multiple. And you see a debate going on between um, different parties uh, taking different bets. CMA, CGM uh, investing in LNG. Um, Maersk investing in hydrogen. Uh, Maersk also investing in ammonia and biomethanol. So you see, see quite a different routes. MSC and Shell partnering up on the LNG side as well. Uh, to be honest, the, the LNG part is, I think, the most sustainable source um, of fuel available today. So if you call, uh, call out and say, well, we need urgency, we need actions now instead of testing others, then, then everyone should go to LNG. However, the infrastructure that you need to build in order to make sure uh, shipping tran transitions to a more sustainable uh, sector uh, couldn't be built on LNG because, in in essence, that's still uh, a fossil fuel. So uh, you can't bet on uh, building an infrastructure on something that works now. You need to also transform into the uh, end game of, of that fuel debate. Um, and actually spraying and praying, if I, as I call it. So, so trying to test multiple sources um, will only uh, worsen the situation because um, you also need to have built infrastructure for that. So ideally, the shipping industry gets together and decides uh, to take one or two fuels as their leading um, uh, fuel type, like the aviation industry has done with their pick for hydrogen, and then build the global supply chain around that. Uh, and, and that's where the ports come in as well, which is a very important, uh, let's say, actor to supply the fuel on multiple spots in the world, as we currently have the bunker ports uh, and, and that infrastructure already locked in. And that can only happen efficiently and cost effectively if you don't test multiple sources, but you actually put every all the money on one or two sources and make sure that within the next, let's say, 30 years, you have a global supply chain of uh, uh, the sustainable fuel of the future. Uh, but that's a debate still ongoing, and that makes it also hard to say, well, it's it's a very fragmented industry, right? There are multiple sources. It's, it's a very commercially driven industry as well. So this is not an easy sector or not an easy case to abate the CO2 emissions, but the, the intentions are there, and I think the technologies are there as well. And also the money is there. Uh, that was made clear as well. It's, this is not about investments, and this is all about picking the right solution, actually collaborate as a sector. So I hope um, we can move forward there. The only thing is that sort of, like I said, there's there's uh, more low hanging fruit than just LNG when it comes to uh, uh, environmental concerns. And, and that really has to do with digitalization. Uh, and luckily, and I'm happy to see that at the moment, seaports are playing catch up uh, with other industries when it comes to digitalization and, and developing a data driven solution. So if you look at this uh, this little chart here, um, uh, looks a bit like the, the Gardner hype cycle. Uh, you see maritime um, really on the brink of disruptive ways uh, when it comes to the digital uh, journey um, and actually catching up to, to automotive and retail uh, and, and other parts of the transportation and logistics sector. The, the freight forwarding, I think, uh, is a bit ahead, uh, but deep sea ports are definitely moving on. Um, and uh, however, if you, if you dive into ports, digitalization, uh, there's still uh, quite a quite a challenge because we see uh, port communities are very diverse. 
Uh, so it's not just the, um, the wide variety of companies and the ecosystems in every port uh, requiring different products and, and services, but it's also the different trades. Uh, and we have realized and, and, and experienced actually firsthand um, that sort of if you want to optimize a chemical port call, uh, that takes uh, quite a lot of planning, uh, a different planning, uh, a more dynamic planning, uh, and a lot more data sources than when you try to optimize a container vessel. Uh, just by the nature of the trade um, and the predictability of the events. Um, and also the geographical location of the port, whether it's a river port or a uh, ocean port, whether there is, uh, and how the port is being organized. We currently look into the US where we see, um, well, I think it's around 30 ports that have uh, 500 port calls or more per year, but they are almost all organized in a different way. One have a those sort of uh, some have a very strong port authority like in Rotterdam as well, or in Algeciras. Others have no such thing and and just more of a marine exchange or a sort of a coalition or a group of a, a membership group. Um, uh, some are state owned, some are private owned. Some of the state owned ports also run the terminal. Others don't. There's there's the typical landlord model has so many different varieties that it is hard to say. Um, this is one. There's one way to digitize a port because that whole infrastructure and the whole community is organized in a different way. Yet, uh, we see a lot of um, benefit from standardizing and, and that not so much about how parties are related to each other, because that's more of a given, but more about um, how you organize data between uh, parties. In the end, every port is different, like I said, but the business process of shipping is very much the same. It's the same contracts, it's the same parties, uh, you also you always almost always need a pilot. Uh, there's always a tug. You need to go to a terminal, whether that's a jetty uh, or a case space. Um, so there is um, a lot to do about standardization when it comes to connecting data. Um, and and we have been part of an international task force uh, for port call optimization, a group of companies that started in Rotterdam, based on a uh, call of action call to action from a captain from Maersk who basically said. I need to write over 400 port memos a year. And the data I use to write that memo uh, regarding undercue clearance, regarding timestamps of ETA uh, arrival, etc., are different in every port. I have multiple sources per port, and I never know which one to trust best. It's my own records. It's the records from the company. It's the information from the port authority. Then it's the information for the IHO. It's all different. Uh, so we need to standardize what we mean with ETA, with um, maintain depth, etc. So that's how a group of uh, leading companies got together in Rotterdam, I think it's about five years back already, and said, let's let's start to standardize this, which, which then became the International Task Force Port Call Optimization, that got endorsed by quite a lot of uh, influential bodies, including BIMCO, IAPH, uh, the International Chamber of Shipping. Um, and they all wrote this document about standardization together with GS1 in the UK Hydrographic Office, um, where they said, this is how we define ETA. This is how we define ETD. This is how we define undercue clearance. Um, and that really brings along a, uh, a lot more consensus about data and how data should be uh, unlocked from ports and, what, uh, and, and also allows uh, software suppliers like port exchange to build solutions that actually not only work in every port, but also give a uniform view of what the information from a port uh, should be. So to the carrier, this is uh, a godsend in that sense, as they were fearing a proliferation of systems, if you will, every port developing its own system with its own standards and then needing them to interact with all these systems one-on-one uh, -on -one with these type of standards uh, and, and, and the, the, especially the uh, Container industry is happy to see now that the DCSA has adopted these standards uh, so that every container port will be uh, working with the same standard in order to um, to optimize shipping and to enable just-in-time sailing. Um, other challenges is a fear of transparency. And this was uh, brought about uh, with a small poll, uh, I think about a month ago on LinkedIn, uh, where, where someone asked, so what are your main what are your main, uh, let's say, um, fears when it comes to sharing data? Uh, and most, uh, I think it was about 49% of the respondents said it's about um, potentially hurting their competitive position or negotiation position, um, which is something that I find very interesting to, to see because on the one hand, we need transparency in order to 
let's say, avoid the problems uh, I shared earlier about uh, waiting a lot, paying the merits a lot, uh, a lot of uncertainty and, and uh, let's say, last minute uh, firefighting when it comes to port operations. But on the other hand, we don't want to give up uh, simple information to allow a solution to solve that because it may hurt us commercially. So here you see very strong that, that commercial element of the shipping industry hampering uh, efficiency solutions uh, taking place. And, and from Rotterdam, we have learned um, to stay away from the commercially sensitive information. Uh, so what we see is that the best way to start this is to actually share data that's already shared. Uh, so things that are already on the website that are already shared between parties, uh, let's say, uh, and digitize that because that really helps everyone to get on the same page and and more of a see more as a, a way to democratize uh, data flow through a port in uh, instead of um, keeping all the data for everyone's self because then you will never get there and uh, that's clear so in the end a, a smart port are the only ports that will survive um, smart means no waste of space uh, time Money and natural resources, all of Merck said this, uh, the OECD. Uh, becoming more digital is not a choice, but a necessity. Uh, if it's not for port operations efficiency, then it's for the for the climate. And, and in order to make shipping a, a lot more efficient and thereby carbon neutral um, industry, um, smart ports are capitalizing on the ever expanding universe of connecting things. Uh, so there's there's the Internet of Things element there. Uh, smart ports imply becoming data minded and uh, new approaches to data management platforms and innovative delivery models and novel governance tactics. So you see, uh, for especially from the port authority side of things, this really drives into your um, the way the port is being operated uh, in Rotterdam. There has been tests with a mandatory data sharing element uh, that was then incentivized by a reduction on the port fees. I know Los Angeles has done the same thing before they got hit, uh, let's say, with their congestion problems. Singapore is testing with it. So you see a few ports around the world finding out ways how to incentivize, uh, let's say, their users or let's say the customers, but also the parties in the port to become more transparent and actually make sure that they benefit from it, not just from an operational point of view, but also a commercial point of view. Um, on the other hand, data analytics and data exchange are becoming a new competitive advantage for port players, capacity sensing, route optimization, energy management, uh, and so on. Um, there, there are quite a lot of uh, use cases and benefits uh, a port can, let's say, achieve by um, taking steps on the digital journey. Uh, advanced data analytics allow for streamlining and optimization of existing infrastructure usage and operations by eliminating unnecessary or anti-transport. In a normal world, um, this would definitely go through now with, with current uh, congestion and, and the, the extremely high um, schedule or low schedule reliability, actually. Uh, uh, this is a bit different because that has other ca causes. However, in the end, um, if we get to um, the zero carbon fuels, these fuels will be likely five to eight times more expensive um, per, per ton of bunker than, than the current fuels. So efficiency will get back on the radar of the carriers and thereby it will get back on the radar of the port communities that they connect with. So um, the smart port is the, sport, uh, the, the port that will stay because it will allow el every carrier to get in and out more efficiently um, like that. Now, now I'd like to share a few things um, about our experiences implementing uh, in, in difficult in different ports. Uh, so one of the first questions I got was where to start with digital transformation. If you are a port, and this is exactly how we did it in Rotterdam, you understand your needs first. So uh, I think it was about seven years ago, the port did a study on, let's say, new strategic themes for um, their next five year in the strategic plan. And they came up with two two topics. One is the energy trans energy transition and the other one is digitalization. And then on the digitalization part, we really dove down into um, what are the main use cases that we can optimize by working together more digital? Is it uh, the port clearance? Is it uh, a port turnaround time? Is it uh, information from case spaces? Uh, is it the um, uh, predictive maintenance. I mean, the list went on and on. I think there were about 100 different use cases. So we really understood the needs of where we thought we could uh, add value by creating a digital infrastructure. And uh, then we were tasked to build a business case. So on these, um, let's say the top 20 ideas really went into the port, talked to a lot of parties to understand what is the current way of working? How could digital be a game changer? And, and what would the investment 
need to be in order to to offset uh, let's say a business case and with that business case uh, we did a readiness assessment so understanding is data ready is data at the right quality what needs to be done to get apis flowing uh, what are the bottlenecks in that and then uh, the port made a make or buy decision uh, and in our case they decided to make it themselves because at the time and this was 2015 or so uh, there was not not a solution readily readily on the market uh, in order to uh, to facilitate the port with a digital um, exchange of data so uh, uh, decided to build it themselves um, but if you currently the, the the market is a lot more let's say uh, matured uh, so there's uh, there's currently a lot of vendors that uh, help out with data exchange platforms and that help with uh, supply chain visibility tools that, uh, that help with out with iot and other i mean yeah there's quite a lot of buzzwords these days about what else you could do in order to digitize your port um, but the main case is to start with your needs and understand really what you want to optimize and then find out what the best um, uh, solution is for that about vendor selection, um, there were a few, uh, you know, uh, supply or insourcing uh, routes that we went through, and we figured out uh, together with with Project Forty Four and other supply chain visibility tool that there is sort of a list of the key questions to ask when when companies select the supply chain visibility tool. Um, very important, obviously, how is the data being collected? Uh, we see um, uh, there's still a lot of manual work. And that's a reality check, uh, but ideally you would like to get uh, you would like to get the um, APIs from companies, and uh, in some cases that works quite well. In, in, in other cases, there is no such thing, uh, and then then it means you need to have a tool that also allows manual entry or actually to overtake and digitize the current process. Um, we we realized in Rotterdam that there is there were there were still terminals, and this is 2000, 2019 still terminals planning on a, uh, a chalkboard in the uh, in the operating room, which is um, uh, good for their operations perhaps, but not easy to share with the rest of the community. So, so we had to build parts of the solution to help also that terminal get connected and actually use our tool to, instead of plan on the chalkboard, plan in the system. How is data being standardized and enriched? Uh, an important one to understand really uh, what type of standards are being used, how compatible are they, uh, how do you enrich the data? So how do you ensure not only the data is reliable, but also adds value? And, and here, the really, the real understanding of the vendor comes in, uh, understanding the business process of shipping, uh, understanding the needs of the carriers and the, uh, the other customers of the port, and also understanding what other types of data sources should be used in order to make it, uh, let's say, uh, actionable. For example, with weather information, with routing systems, with AIS. Um, uh, well, as a lay question, I think it's a general one uh, in terms of what is the, is it on-premise or in the cloud, what types of services are being supported, etc. Um, the industry security standard is obviously in a very important one. I think the, the maritime sector has waken up to uh, data security and, um, um, and overall security of, of software solutions. Um, so it is very important to, to at least have the I, ISO uh, 27001. Um, what is the, for example, an interesting one, especially for ports, is how do you integrate hinterland and other modes of transport? So, so if it's just, is it just the port, or do you also so does the solution also allow for API out to, to other parties further down the value chain? Um, we experience currently, for example, that with one of our tools, the ship tracker, uh, which basically gives you the good ETA of when a vessel arrives. We get a lot of a lot of uh, accounts created uh, and interests from hinterland parties. Uh, so that tells you that there is a lot of everyone is scrambling for the latest information on the port and, and on a vessel, um, any source they can get. So so making sure that your port gets sort of visibility towards the hinterland is an important element. Um, now then obviously analytics, this is becoming data driven. Um, uh, we're currently in the data informed stage, so so make sure the data is there. But then the next step, obviously, is how do you analyze and what what is the value of the analytics you provide as a tool? Um, is there historic performance reporting? Is it uh, can you let's say have a look at different times of the year, seasonal reporting? Can you look at the certain KPIs in comparison to other ports or to other? actors within the port, uh, that type of depth of analysis uh, should be there because the data is there at a certain point. 
Uh, and then eventually, I think a very important one is to understand what the return on investment timetable is for implementing a, a project. So how long does it take? What benefits will you get by when? Uh, how much in-kind effort is there required from, let's say, the, uh, the customer in order to make the implementation a success? Um, so so that's, that's some of the learnings. Um, we have a standardized approach to implementing, right? So we standardize the data first. We digitize the different sources in the port. And if needed, uh, we move to collaborate, which is more of a, um, a project where we run the, um, let's say we, we, we create a coalition and we actually run projects to optimize collaboration. And then in the end, you get to, to optimize where you use analytics to, um, to really on, on, on how port calls and the whole connectivity of the port is managed. Um, Rotterdam is at the optimized level. Uh, most of the other ports are still in collaborate. Uh, I think Altiseros is also in optimized. So there's a few ports that sort of really lead the way uh, when it comes to digitalization, but it all started with digitize. So in, in the end, um, a solution should fit also the maturity level of a port. Uh, and this is something we learned firsthand while, while trying to work with ports across the world in the last two years. Um, trying to, to to create for them the benefits that Rotterdam is currently experiencing with these double-digit efficiency gains and um, and the reduction in CO2. And the problem is not everyone is there at the same page. So it's not easy to say, let's all get the data in, let's make sure that all the data is, is reliable and it's quality, and we start collaborating on this. Um, that, was not, that was not done in one day in, in Rotterdam. That took a few years. And that's the same for other ports. So we have, uh, let's say, uh, built this framework to make sure that whatever you want to start with is really aligned with uh, where the port and the digital infrastructure of the port and its users actually is. So that it helps, uh, let's say, port communities in every step of the journey uh, on the path uh, to impact. Um, on our end, uh, basically, we, we provide a platform that allows parties to gain efficiency in every step of the port call. So that's the just-in-time arrival that I spoke about, uh, allowing the vessel to slow steam or to adjust speed in, on, in its approach to the port, and thereby uh, saving uh, uh, more from, uh, firsthand more time, saving time in, in, in fuel and emissions. Then also the part from the of shipping um, requires quite a lot of machine learning and, uh, and AI to really predict, uh, let's say, the right the travel times between the pilot port blaze and berth, because the berth arrival obviously is the important part for the terminal to be connected with, not just the arrival to the uh, to the pilot boarding place. And this is also where the most of the congestion and most of the delays occur. So of this, let's say. Uh, 80% of the travel time is at sea, uh, only 20% is in the port, but 80% of the delays occur in the port because of uh, Tug's pilots, the whole um, port infrastructure. Um, and basically, that's why it is important to understand the, uh, the travel times between pilot boarding place and, and, the, and the berth. Then, obviously, the berth visit uh, when there's a shift. So when uh, you, need, you need to have terminal data to understand when the vessel is leaving. Uh, and the terminal is is one of the most influential parties here because they really have their own planning uh, and their own uh, resource allocation that determines uh, when a vessel is ready to leave. Obviously, there's additional services to be had in some ports, bunkering, supplies, etc., crew changes. So that information usually comes either from the port or from the agent. So that's important to have uh, in order to do, give a good prediction of the, um, the time of departure. And then the whole process repeats, uh, right, uh, from from the uh, from the berth back to the, the pilot boarding place, and then back at sea. So this is how we see uh, the different uh, parts of the business process of shipping through a port, and then connected to the data from the different users to really give insight and understanding, but also predictable or uh, value to other users to see this is what is going to happen with this port call in the next couple of hours or days. Then a few experiences from implementing the, uh, the digital infrastructure in ports, all right? So like I said, multiple ports across Europe and the US. First one is start small, really. Uh, uh, we started small in Rotterdam and it worked quite well. We started small in Felixstowe and Algeciras and it worked very well with, with very short timelines and a quick implementation and also a quick gathering of like-minded people to, to drive this change. 
Um, in some other ports, we started with a lot of companies, um, and that was partly driven by the trade, but also um, and because of um, uh, parties who are eager to join. Uh, and that, that came across a lot more difficult because you need to keep everyone aligned. Uh, so this is a new thing. This is a new way of collaborating. This is new data to be shared. Uh, and although about everyone wants to use that, he wants to be part of that change, that's fine. But not everyone is able. And, and you know, if you make the group too big, you run the risk of actually never finishing. Uh, so start small, create uh, the first benefits, and then scale up. Another one is to build a coalition of the willing and able. Uh, very important to find the right parties in the port working together and actually have a mindset and also time available and data to basically start this. So it's, it's a bit of a kickoff project uh, and the ability to share data either uh, through a manual work or to an API preferably uh, is a very important element. And we've seen also in other ports when it takes too long to get the right data, um, parties start to sort of switch off again and, and you lose momentum. So a small group with parties that are willing and also able to share data uh, will give you the, the best results quick. And that becomes a proof point to other ports or other parties in the port also to start uh, joining, uh, joining the, the journey. Um, very important to take care of data availability before you start. So um, we have we have been stuck in projects for quite a bit because we uh, underestimated the availability of data and the quality of the data. So um, uh, we were halfway already in this, and then realizing there were no APIs or there were parties who were just not having the planning discipline to actually be able to give frequent updates about uh, changes in their terminal or changes in their operations. Um, and that really hampered the progress of the, the project, but also the willingness of the others to keep working on it. So it's very important that you get a good feel of what data is available, what is needed to get the data available in the right quality, and then kick off uh, with a vendor to basically start the project, because otherwise you'll be um, stuck halfway and you'll lose the risk of, of losing momentum, if you have the risk of losing momentum. Um, finally, uh, with this nice picture of the Rotterdam Marathon, I'd like to close off with, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So the first steps can be sprints, right? Getting the data ready, understanding your use case, really understanding, um, um, let's say, and getting that coalition together with a vendor or building something uh, to start with. Um, but eventually it's a marathon uh, to get all parties connected, to make the connection to the hinterland, to start optimizing the port and become more data-driven, uh, let's say, operations. That's, that's really a long-term play. Uh, so it has to be part of a strategic imperative. And, and that's basically what I started with uh, and, and how Rotterdam, Houston, and some of the other ports also perceive this, is to say we make at least a five-year agreement on, on, on running uh, a marathon and basically building all the things needed in, in the course of five years to basically get to a, a fully digital infrastructure. Um, so without that, with that, I'd like to close off. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, and if we have time, uh, we have also, um, there's time for some questions. Back to you, Kunita. Thank you, Shor, for your presentation. Now I open for the Q&A session. If you have any question to Shor, you can just uh, click the raise hand button or just type your question on the Q&A tabs. So we will, uh, we will wait for a few uh, seconds or a minute if anyone want to ask a question to you, sure. Okay, I guess everyone is clear your, with your presentation. And also, if they want to ask a further question to you, uh, they can just reach out to your uh, email. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, uh, we will inform as well to our delegates who cannot join uh, live sessions today. Very good. About that. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, sure, for your time this morning there. Thank no you problem. so much uh, for presenting uh, here. And also uh, I wanna close this, uh, conference with you right now just a little bit of time so yes you are reaching at the end of the second annual uh, digital ports uh, virtual summit 
Thank you for all speakers who have shared the valuable insight for all of us. And thank you for attending second annual Digital Ports Virtual Summit. Again, I'd like to remind you to submit the evolution form that has been sent to your registered email address in order to receive your e certificate. On behalf of True Vetus, I'd like to extend our apology for any inconvenience happened during the event. And thank you for joining us in this conference. See you at our next conference and please stay safe. Thank you so much, Shor, once again. For Thanks, your everyone. Time. Thanks for having me. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. Bye bye.